welcome back to Wounded for War, guys. Uh, today, we are uh, going to be joined by uh, my lovely wife. Uh, and the reason why is because we're going to be journeying through the wall. Yes, I said it. That's the next session, Journey Through the Wall. We're, uh, we're going through a course called EHS. It's uh, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Uh, I am, uh, this is a pilot course, and so I'm learning just as much as you are in the process of this. Um, and my wife has been on the journey as well a bit with me. Uh, I want to just uh, say, uh, I apologize right off the bat if you guys usually tune in right at nine o'clock to see this, uh, as you may know, if you watch my feed, uh, a week and a few days ago, I had a major accident. Uh, uh, I don't know if you could call it an accident. If you're skateboarding, that's kind of on purpose. So, you know, uh, I guess it goes in the stupidity category. But um, I, uh, I got nine staples to the head, broken tailbone, in which I'm sitting on only a week later, um, and some nerve damage to my arm and shoulder. So. Uh, I'm, it's, it's taken a little longer to get things rolling this morning, so I apologize if you guys tuned in right at 9 o'clock. However, I do think that what God has planned for us today is, is pretty special. So, we're going to go through, as usual, uh, a, a course training by Pete Scazzaro. He's going to lead us in what this means, uh, this journeying through the wall. It's, uh, it's already been, uh, we've been through a few different uh, cat categories of, of this emotionally healthy spirituality journey. And uh, we understood the, the problem with emotionally unhealthy spirituality. We went into session two, which was know yourself that you may know God. Session three was probably the hardest for me. I don't know about you, but going back in order to go forward. And so being left with that last uh, teaching, going back to go forward, um, it's, it's kind of left me with this anxiety of, okay, I, I, I can't wait. Now that I've journeyed back and, and revisited all the pain, I, I want to move forward quickly. And uh, this week's journey through the wall is going to help us understand what that journey looks like, what the, what the timeline, as well as uh, maybe a little bit of what uh, is in store for us during that time. So, uh, why don't you guys stay tuned? We're going to watch uh, the, the session four teaching by uh, Pete Scazzaro. Then I'm going to go ahead and uh, do a little quick study on uh, his teaching through uh, the life of Abraham. And then uh, my wife and I are going to just kind of chat about kind of what's going on. You want to say hi? Hi. <laughs> so, we're going to chat about how this applies. Oftentimes, we hear the most... Um, uh, from people, hey, the Bible is cool and all with these old 2,000-year-old great stories, but how is it relevant to today, to my life? Well, that's where we come in. We're going to share a bit of our journey and how this applies to help maybe you apply it to your life. All right? So, uh, stay tuned. We're going to start that uh, video now. image of the Christian life as a journey captures our experience of following Christ like few others. Because journeys involve movement and action, stops and starts, detours, delays, trips into the unknown. It also gives us the long view of the Christian life. Think about it. God called Abraham to leave his past in Ur at the age of 75 to go on a journey. God called Moses out of a burning bush to begin a new phase of his life at the age of 80 to go on a journey. God called the Israelites to leave Egypt and embark on a 40-year journey of personal transformation in the desert to the Promised Land. God called David to leave the comforts of his job as a shepherd, as a teenager, to fight Goliath and take a journey that would lead him to serve as King of Israel. Jesus called the 12 disciples to change their lives forever, leave their jobs to go on a journey with him. You're on a journey and so am I. But it's a truth about the Christian life that at one point or another, you will hit a wall. By a wall, I'm referring to a season in your life when you will feel stuck. Consider the story of a woman named Agnes. From the time she was a young girl, Agnes believed, not just believed, she was on fire. She wanted to do great things for God. She said things such as she wanted to love Jesus as he'd never been loved before. Agnes had an undeniable calling. She, she wrote in her journal that my soul at present is in perfect peace and joy. 
She experienced a union with God that was so deep, so continual, that for her it was a, a rapture, an ecstasy. She left her home. She became a missionary. She gave up everything. After a while, however, it seemed as if God had abandoned her. At least that's how it felt to her. She started writing different words in her journal, words like, where is my faith? And she asked, deep down, there, there's nothing but emptiness and darkness. Oh God, how painful this is, this unknown pain. I have no faith. She struggled to pray. She still worked, she still served, she still smiled, but she struggled at the wall that didn't seem to move. This inner darkness continued on year after year for nearly 50 years. God seemed absent. Such was the secret pain of Agnes, who is better known today as Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa wrote letters intended, not only, intended really only for her spiritual directors about the torment in her soul. But after her death, they were published. And these letters stunned people. Some prominent atheists said that Mother Teresa had lost her faith. Many said she struggled with clinical depression. But spiritually, she would hit a wall. But as we know today, God was doing a mighty work in and through her. And it was this wall that made her the great woman she is today. I meet many believers today who are also at a wall. Some have even dropped out. They often fail to see the larger picture of the transforming work of what God is seeking to do in them. That this wall is essential to their maturing in Christ and becoming the person God intends. And the disorientation, the pain of their present circumstances, it blinds them. But throughout church history, great men and women have written about the phases of this journey to help us understand the larger map, the larger picture of what God is doing in our lives. In the critical journey stages in the life of faith, the authors developed a model that included the essential place of the wall in our journeys. And the following is my adaptation of their work. I want you to note that each stage builds naturally upon the other. In the physical world, babies must grow into young children and then into teenagers who become adult, men and women. In a similar way, spiritually, each stage builds on the ones that go before it. An important difference, however, is that we can stagnate very easily at a certain stage and choose not to move forward in our journeys with Christ. We can refuse to trust God into this unknown, mysterious place. So let's take a look at the stages. So stage one, you'll notice it's called life-changing awareness of God. This stage, whether in childhood or adulthood, is the beginning of our journey with Christ as we become aware of his reality. We realize our need for mercy and begin our relationship with him. Stage two is discipleship. This stage is characterized by learning about God and what it means to be a follower of Christ. We become part of a Christian community and we begin to get rooted in the disciplines of the faith. Stage three is the active life. This is described as, as the doing stage. We get involved, we actively work for God, we serve him and his people. We take responsibility, we bring our unique talents and gifts to serve Christ in the world. Stage four is the wall and the journey inward. Notice that the wall and the inward journey are closely related. The wall drives us into an inward journey. In some cases, people feel compelled to this journey that, that eventually leads them to the wall. Other times, it's the wall that leads them to the inward journey. It's rightly been said that 85% of evangelicals do not get through the wall. Our image of God often does not allow for such a difficult experience. But if we get through it, we end up in stage five, which is called the journey outward. Having passed through the crises of faith and the intense inner journey work necessary to go through the wall, we begin once again to move outward to do for God. We may do some of the same active external things we did before, like give leadership or initiate acts of mercy toward other people. The difference is now that we're giving out of a grounded new center in ourselves with God. And then stage six is transformed by love. That's really God's goal in the language of John Wesley, is that we might be made perfect in love, that Christ's love becomes our love, both towards God and other people. We realize that love truly is the beginning and it's the end. And by this stage, the perfect love of God has driven out all fear. We're free. And the whole of our spiritual lives is finally about surrender and obedience to God's perfect will. For most of us, the wall appears through a crisis that turns our world upside down. It comes perhaps through a divorce or a job loss, the death of a close friend or family member, a cancer diagnosis, a disillusioning church experience. The wall might come through a betrayal or a shattered dream or a wayward child or a car accident or an inability to get pregnant or a deep desire to marry that remains unfulfilled or a dryness or loss of joy in our relationship with God. We, we question ourselves, we question God, we question the church, and we discover that for the first time our faith doesn't appear to work. 
we have more questions than answers at the very foundation, as, uh, at the very foundation of our lives, and it feels like our, our faith is on the line. We don't know where God is, we don't know what he's doing, we don't know where he's going, how he's getting us there, or when this will ever be over. I've experienced uh, at least five or six major walls in my life, each of which changed me forever. Uh, let me just share two. Uh, the first was in 1994 when, when we had a, a split in one of the congregations in Spanish that we had established. I, I felt betrayed, I was outraged, my faith was shaken. Everything in me wanted to quit Christianity. Uh, that was the beginning uh, of this whole expanded view of God in Scripture that we call emotionally healthy spirituality today. Uh, the second was in actually 1996 when my marriage with Jerry hit a wall. Uh, our marriage was in deep trouble. We were great friends, but God met both of us out of that deep season of pain. Uh, and out of that help that we, we eventually got and went after, we have a marriage today that's so far beyond any of our dreams. We made a decision to live out of the joy and overflow of our marriage. And equipping and training people to have marriages that taste and point to heaven is actually the greatest joy of our lives. And it comes out of the fact that we didn't have it in our early years. And so on a certain level, it's correct to say that walls come to us in various ways throughout our lifetimes. It's not simply a one-time event that we pass through and get beyond. It appears to be something that we return to as part of our ongoing relationship with God. We see this, for example, in Abraham. He's waiting at the wall for 25 years for his first child with his wife, Sarah, to be born. He hits another wall when he has to let go of his eldest child, Ishmael. 10 to 13 years later, God leads him again to another wall the sacrificing of his son that he loves, Isaac, on an altar. So regardless of how we get there, every follower of Jesus at some point will confront the wall. The best way to understand the dynamics of the wall is to examine the classic work of John of the Cross. Uh, in, in his famous book, The Dark Night of the Soul, it was written 500 years ago. I mean, he describes the journey uh, in, in three phases, beginners, progressives, and perfect. But to move out of being a beginner stage, he says, it requires receiving the gift of God that comes through the dark night, or I'm calling it here, the wall. He says this is the ordinary way that we grow in Christ. And a failure to understand this is one of the major reasons many people start out on the journey but do not finish. So how do we know we're in a dark night, as he calls it? Well, our good feelings of God's presence evaporate. We feel the door of heaven perhaps has been shut as we pray. There's a sense of darkness or helplessness, weariness, a sense of failure and defeat and dryness and emptiness kind of descends on us. The Christian disciplines or the way that we've lived it out, the Christian life up to now, they don't really work any longer. We really can't see what God's doing and, and there's little visible fruit externally in our lives. This actually is God's way, he writes, about of rewiring and purging our affections, our, our passions, as he calls it. He, he does this so that we might delight in God's love and enter into a rich, fuller communion with him. You see, God wants to communicate to us his true sweetness and love. He, he longs for us that we might know his true peace and rest. But to get there, however, false layers and unhealthy attachments inside of us must be burned away. Only then will we actually be able to taste and see that the Lord is good. Only then we actually surrender to his will and his love and not our own. At the wall, we learn that true faith is trusting God even when we don't feel him. You may hate walls. We may hate walls, but they are God's gift to us. So let me just close with two thoughts here. First is there is a difference between walls and trials. The trials we encounter each day are not the wall or the dark night of the soul. Trials are traffic jams, annoying bosses, delayed airplane departures, car breakdowns, fever, barking dogs in the middle of the night. James consider them, considers them in James 1, consider it pure joy, my brothers, he writes, whenever you face trials of many kinds. That's trials. Walls are David fleeing a jealous king for 13 years in the desert for his life. Walls are 11 disciples of the crucifixion who are confused and disoriented and wondering if they've wasted their whole lives. Walls are Job losing his 10 children, his health, and his possessions in a day. But secondly, it's all, it can be difficult to discern precisely when we began the journey through the wall and when we might actually be on the other side of the wall. Ultimately, God is the one who moves us through the wall. And with that comes mystery. There's a lot we do not understand about the ways of God. His ways are not our ways. 
yet there are rich treasures at that wall. Our image and understanding of God is dramatically transformed. We often have God in a very small box. The wall blows that box open. We begin to see God for who he really is, sovereign, mighty, loving, good. Our work at that wall is to stay with God, to persevere, to faithfully wait on him, to stick with him, even when everything in us wants to quit and run. Why? For he's good and his love endures forever. Failure to understand and surrender to God's working in us at the wall often results, if not always results, in long-term pain and confusion. I know many people have had been through great sufferings and hit massive walls. Yet the walls did not change them. They only bounced off them. They returned to a similar but different wall later. Yet receiving the gift of God at the wall that comes to each of us transforms our lives forever in ways that we never dreamed. So enjoy. All right, <clears throat> so there was a lot uh, given to us in there. Uh, Pete, basically, if I could, if I could summarize it in, in one um, thought, it would be that Pete's essentially telling us uh, once we are aware of how broken we are or the pains that we've been through, uh, we're, we're, we're bringing them to God. Um, what happens at that time is we're in a vulnerable place of being wounded, aware of it, but at the same token, waiting on healing, waiting on restoration, waiting on <clears throat> the promises of God in your life. And so that could be daunting that could be um, the place where uh, oftentimes, like Pete said, people bail because it's just too hard, too long. And uh, we live in a culture of instant gratification. And so it's, it's, it's antithetical to what we want in life. It's antithetical to what we desire and, and, and really uh, what we're built for by culture. I want to jump in <clears throat> a little bit deeper to what Pete was saying about uh, Abraham's life. I want to parallel that with our life. And so uh, I'm going to read this real quick, and then we're going to just kind of uh, pull a couple nuggets out of it. And then uh, I want to ask some questions to this lovely lady next to me. So in Genesis 22, 1 through 14, Pete referenced Abraham and his life, right? And so I'm going to, I'm going to read it real quick, and then we're going to go ahead and dive in. So it says, Abraham in his earthly pilgrimage with God, appeared to go through a number of walls. His greatest one, however, came when God asked him to do the unthinkable, to kill his son, Isaac. Now we're going to read this section. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abe, and he said, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, in whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain. I will show you. Early the next morning, Abe got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God told him to go on the third day. Notice that right off the bat on the third day. This isn't uh, God springing something on him and that he has to do immediate. This is a, he, he has to go through this for three days, this excruciating thing. So it says <clears throat> that for three days on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, then we'll come back to you. I love his, his wording here because he's, he's, he's confident in God. Notice, um, God had told him, go kill your son. Now, ironically, though God gave him the instruction, it seems to me that Abraham has faith in God that he's not gonna end up killing his son, 
even though he said he would. And the reason why he says, we will worship and then we will come back to you. He has a confidence there that God's going to do something. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Hey, uh, Dad? <laughs> and yes, my son, Abe replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but uh, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Great question. I'm pretty sure I would have been asking the same if I was in his shoes. Abe answered, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Again, confidence in God. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abe built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound up his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now, it's estimated by most theologians that though it's talking about him in the, in the frame of like a boy or in your mind, maybe you've read the Bible or seen images and it shows like a, a, a child, a young child, that a man could easily um, tie up and put on the altar. However, that's actually not the case. Most, theolog most theologians know that he's somewhere in his like 20s to 30s while Abe is later in his years based on uh, history. And so he's tying up his son. His son is also in this moment trusting his dad, even though this seems completely ludicrous. So he binds him up, puts him on the altar of the wood. Then he reaches out with his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And this is the moment that we have to wait for. But the angel of the Lord called out from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not, do nothing to harm him. He says, now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld your son from me, your only son. Abraham looked up. There in the thicket, he saw a ram with its horns. It was caught. He went over, took the ram, sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day on that mountain, the Lord will provide. So, listen, what's interesting about that is in this account, Abraham shows this faith, this trust in his God. He's saying, look, I look back and I see that I shouldn't even have the son that I have. God did a miracle once. And so because he did a miracle once, I can trust that he'll do a miracle again. Sometimes we have to look back at that journey we've been on to look at the journey we're in and trust that God's there. He, he gives these statements of how he's trusting God that he's going to provide. And yet, all the while, he's actually having to do the actions that feel opposite. So first thing we know, Abe's not being led by his emotions. If he was, he wouldn't be taking that knife. He would, he'd be arguing with God. He'd be pissed at God. And uh, there would be a battle there. Instead, he's leaning back on those moments where God said, you're going to have a son. He says, yeah, I'm 100 years old. My wife's 90-something uh, years old. That's not in the cards. You know, we're not going to have a kid in diapers. We're in diapers, right? So... The reality is, is he knows that God had provided kid against the odds. Like, there's no possible way that could have happened, yet it happened. And so he's going to look at God through that same lens in this moment and say, though it doesn't seem like it can happen, he's going to do something. God will provide himself a sacrifice. I, I want to... The reason why I, I brought my wife in on this is because uh, it would be easy honestly, for me to parallel my life 
And in those moments where I've had great faith or, or, or lack of faith or whatever, um, I don't ever want myself to sound like a hero or I'm the person that you know, talks about myself in, in a great light. And, and I don't need my wife to do the same. Um, so I, I took this opportunity to just talk about our journey and walls we faced and how that has, um, how we've processed through them, hoping that that will help you process through it as well. So what, what would you say after um, all listening to all that you heard, uh, what would you say are some of the biggest on our journey, some of the biggest walls God has led us to, through, and are we in one currently that you see? And um, what are what are your thoughts towards God? How are you processing it? What's what's your view in uh, in this season on this? I feel like I am currently. In the, the season of being in a wall, up against a wall still. How so? Well, the biggest wall I think we've faced is losing our home and our company and um, moving up, up here away from all of our friends and just trusting God that he is going to restore us and Just the learning to trust him through it has been difficult. So why do you even have a notion that you're going to be restored? Because I, he reminds me of all the past times that he's brought us through crazy times. And I have to just trust that he'll do it again, even though it, this time seems to be a lot longer of a process. So it's funny, you during the video we were watching with Pete Scazzaro and it's it's muted for us um, so that you're not hearing our conversation, but um, she says, what do, you, what do you do if you feel like you've been in one for four years? And I said, keep watching the video. And he talks about how like it could be long. It could be a long season. It could be really hard because of the length of time, right? Is there ever a moment where you told me that, it, you know, do you ever feel like you know, it's going to go four years. So I'm going to assume that that's how long you feel like you've been against this wall. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So in the four years that you've been in this uh, season, or we've really been in this season, what has God taught you through it? How has God changed you and built your character through it? Well, he's taught me to trust him in the big, difficult things. Not only were we both up against a wall, you were dealing with a lot. You could be open about all my struggles, but um, have at it. Emotionally and diagnosed with PTSD or complex PTSD and on top of just uh, the trials or wall per se, but we were up against, we were also dealing I was dealing with trying to love you through probably the most difficult time you were having. And I had to learn to trust God in a really scary thing. I just, I felt so helpless. I mean, I felt helpless before because of the situation. But when you see the person you love struggle as hard as you were and you can't physically do anything but get on your knees and pray and that's what I did and then I saw God bring you through that um it's just taught me to really give him the time to do work and trust that the time is all for a purpose to to grow us to be more like him wow um I'll be honest, uh, I'm taken back because I'm learning a lot and, and it's, it's exciting. Um, 
So you said you were going through a lot. You said that you were really hurting because your loved one was hurting and you didn't know what to do and you couldn't do anything but pray. How did God meet you in that time? It, what Pete said was that like it's a, a dark night, right? Um, it, it was, I without question would say that that was the season I was in. And it brought you into one. And so uh, as a married couple, um, you were battling for the sanity and of, of your loved one and partner in life, but also you were battling for your marriage. Mm -hmm. How did God meet you particularly during that time? How did he comfort you? In what ways were you able to keep going on? Because keep in mind, people want to know, how do I make it one more day when it feels like an eternity? Well, I just... I. He met me by bringing certain people into your life to help you in the ways that I couldn't. And he just reminded me that he's, he had you and that you were in a process that needed to happen. And I just needed to be patient. And I hate that word and I hate praying for that word because... <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't, right? <laughs> Lord, make me more humble and patient. Nobody wants to pray those prayers, right? But he, yeah, he just, he just reminded me that you're his first and he loves you and he's mm -hmm. doing this to heal you and, and at the, on the other end of it, it's yeah. all going to be worth it. Sounds like what you learned a lot of was that by you not being able to do anything and one of the most, you know, I'm assuming I'm using your phraseology, uh, someone who you loved dearly in your life, you couldn't help, but you wanted to. And so the only thing that you could do is pray. Did that leave you feeling helpless? Mm -hmm. It did. And then, but when God would answer it in ways that you couldn't necessarily personally help, but he was answering your prayers along the way, was that encouraging at all? Well, yeah, it was encouraging. Okay, and so as it encouraged you, you prayed more, you leaned in more? Is that a fair Yeah, one? because I also suffer from anxiety, so I was also going through my own whirlwind in my own head. Yeah, it was... Your own dark night next door to a dark night of someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right in the bed, same same bed <laughs> next door. Um, well, you know, uh, for me, uh, I I would say that I watched, obviously, from a different perspective. I was unraveling mm -hmm. and tail spinning, and I had zero control of my own mental capacities and uh very i had to, at the same token i'm having to be responsible for you know a few million dollars in projects uh at work um i am the bottom line for them uh for those i'm i'm responsible for the health and wealth and well-being of my my children and my wife and i had no capacity no ability as she clearly stated to do any of those things and I'm not talking well or you know I had no capacity like I was falling apart and and for me what kept me going was as I prayed and and I'm going to be frank and, and really blunt it's in these seasons of being at the wall where I feel like you got to be real with God like don't throw in pithy prayers like you got to be real this is where you throw your fist up at god sometimes and and you think for sure he's done with me so i'm just going to tell him i'm done with him and i'm pissed and i'm and i'm screaming at god why aren't you here now i i don't recommend it but if you're there he's big enough to handle it you know i i would always say take the approach of humility first you know uh, but I but I also want to be very clear in that God is not afraid of dysfunctional people. 
He's not afraid of people that are messy. He specializes in that. In that. So I, I would just encourage you, wherever you're at, don't be afraid to be real with God. There were times during the season she's talking about, wouldn't you say that you, you cursed and you got very angry with God? And, and I did the same. And, uh, and I just want to encourage you that God was still gracious to us. And he'll be gracious to you. Be real. That's the first step. Uh, Pete um, talked about some phases and some, some things that you go through in this uh, journey. You know, he says it's a journey through the wall. I would say, just look at it this way, is that there's steps to maturity, right? There's steps to being more mature emotionally, not letting our emotions drive us, but letting uh, emotions be there, process through the emotions, grieve the emotions, uh, rejoice about the emotions, feel the emotions, process them. But don't let them lead you. And and the, the way that that's done is, you know, he talked about in the very beginning, we become aware of God. That's kind of that, hey, God really exists. Okay, I want to want to research this a little more. I want to understand him. But but I give my life to him. I trust him enough for that step. And then the next would be learning as a disciple. And that's kind of, you know, you're, you're hey, I want to I want to learn more. I want to know more about him. Um, I want to know more about my life in him, in God, right? But then um, he talked about service. So we become kind of, uh, okay, I'm dedicated. I want to buy in. I want to serve others then. And so we start to serve. And the problem with those three steps so far is that oftentimes we're very uh, self-centered. Wouldn't you say? Like in our first part of our walk, like, hey, I want Jesus because I want out of my problem. Mm -hmm. It's still about me. And then, oh, well, I'm going to learn more about him because I want to gain more out of this. And then, well, I want to serve because it's out of an obligation. I feel now I'm part of a group and, and I want to be a part of this and, and really own it. Um, but it's still somewhat about me. And then what happens is we journey into this point where what Pete says is the wall, right? And, and that wall is, it's not about you. I would say the whole wall is... A lifelong, every one of the walls you'll go through will be a lifelong tearing down of it being about you, it being about me, it being about us, right? And that causes us, as he said, to, that some people won't do this, but you have to look inward. It's funny. You, God says, it's not about you. And he says, but look inward because you're going to find that you're worse off than you think you are. But it also reflects back on how good he is that he would let us in. And now we're in a deep place of centered worship, right worship. And now we can go, as he said, outward and love like Jesus loves. We can see as uh, we can see people as broken, but love lovable and, and people that we want to uh, care for because we understand how broken we are. That's when, and that's when we understand the goodness of God, when we realize how, how jacked we are, and then his greatness looks even better. And, and so those are those steps that he talks about. We've walked through these walls before many times, but we're walking through a big one now. And so I wanted to share some of this stuff with you. I wanted to share some of the things that how we're processing through it. Uh, I would say... Uh, to be honest with you guys, it could take a long time, to be fair. And uh, it, it could take a long time because like baking, you know, you don't want to bring the, the, the cake out before it's done. Otherwise, it's useless. It's, it's doughy. It's, it's, it actually could create sickness uh, by letting someone eat that before it's done. But if the cake is completely done or the bread is completely baked, whatever it was designed to be is actually created over time, right? And when that bread comes out and someone tastes it, it's just so delicious, so warm, so uh, nutritious. Well, in the same way, when we have that marinated time in God and he's really washing over our life, 
in a season where you feel vulnerable, useless maybe, the drama's just not ending, the pressure heat is, is hot and you, you want out, my encouragement to you is reflect back on what God has done in the past. And if you don't have a personal story, hold on to other people's stories. They're in the Bible for a reason. God being faithful, God being good. And I wanted you to hear it from ourselves because some people could look at the Bible and say, it's 2,000 years old. It's not really relevant today. Well, I'm telling you, she's telling you, we've walked this out. We're walking it out right now. And God's been faithful and he's good. And uh, after losing everything, can I ask you one last question? Mm -hmm. After losing everything, after having to give up all your comforts of, you know, creature comforts and your friends and family and Cali and the beautiful beaches and, and the cars and uh, the home that we had to, you know, lose the money, all of it, security, everything. Would you trade it for what God's doing in your life? No, because I was trusting on trusting on those things and leaning on those things and not trusting in the Lord. And it's a hard lesson to learn, but I'd rather learn it and become better because of it than You're more beautiful to me because of it. <laughs> it's true. Character wise and you've I've told you that. Character and nature and everything. You are more attractive as a godly woman. And the more he works in you, the more godly you become. No, well, I pray that he uses our story to help others. Yeah. Well, on that note, why don't we pray for them and close this out. And uh, would you mind praying for, for the people that will actually watch this? Sure. Father God, we just thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. We pray, Father, that uh, we would not lose sight of that as we go through the yeah. difficult things in life. Father, that um, we would be reminded of, of your goodness and your provision and your love for us. That yeah. You love us enough to continue that work in us that you started, Lord, to build character, to use us um, in others' lives, to to be an example of you, Lord. I just, I pray yes, that our eyes would be focused on you, and I pray, Father, that we would all continue to pray and give you the room to do the work in us that's necessary. Yes. I pray that you would just encourage us all today. And we thank you and praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, guys, welcome. Uh, I mean, welcome. Thank you for joining us at Wounded for War. Uh, really appreciate your guys' time. I hope this is a blessing to you. And uh, as we journey through the wall together this week, uh, we will keep you in prayer and keep us in prayer. Uh, there are forces working against us, putting these videos out every week. Is, is that not a, yeah. a true statement? <laughs> uh, so uh, we love you guys and we will see you next time on Wounded for War.